Good afternoon. I'm David Talbot, Managing Director and Head of Research here at Red Cloud Securities. And we're thrilled to have John Champaglia here, who's the CEO of Sprott Asset Management with us today. Sprott Physical Uranium Trust has been a force to be reckoned with this year uh, in the spot uranium market. It has instigated buying in the market that has launched uranium prices from 30 bucks to almost 50 bucks right now. It appears that if the fund has acquired about 15 million pounds over the last two months. So following John's remarks, we will have what I expect to be quite a fascinating Q&A session. Attendees, please feel free to ask your questions using the Q&A link and we'll get to as many as we can. So John, why don't you introduce yourself and then you can take it away. Sure. Thank you so much, David, and uh, welcome to all the uh, the viewers today. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about the uranium sector and and specifically the the Sprott Uranium Trust. So, uh, as David said, I'm the CEO of Sprott Asset Management. I've been at Sprott for about 11 years, uh, which is amazing. Um, it's gone very quickly, and uh, we're very excited to be talking about our new uranium trust, uh, affectionately known in the marketplace uh, with the acronym SPOT. To, uh, for today's presentation, I'm going to cover a little bit about what we see in the uranium market, why we think it's an interesting investment idea right now, and then talk a little bit about the trust and, and uh, how it's been operating for its first three months of its life. So let's just jump into it. All right. Give me a moment. Is it possible to just forward the slide for me? There we go, okay. All right, we'll start with the investment case for Uranium. There we go, now she's working. Okay, so there's basically five key drivers that we think make Uranium an interesting uh, investment idea. Um, first of all, it's about its efficiency and effectiveness in generating power. That's obviously what, it, what Uranium is for. It's to generate power through nuclear reactors. And I think there's a growing realization in the world that nuclear, although it's very polarizing, the topic uh, for many people due to uh, uh, historical accidents, it is still one of the most reliable forms of energy. Uh, it is still very safe and it is very clean. And that's becoming very, very important as, as uh, countries around the world are committing to greenhouse gas re reduction strategies and, and the Paris Climate Accord. Second of all, we think that uranium is finally coming out of a long protracted bear market, and that is generating a lot of renewed interest from investors around the world. Uh, second, third of all, non-utility buyers, um, which the trust would be one, along with different other investment funds and junior miners have been buying up a lot of uranium in the last year, which has also given the sector a big boost. And also when you look at what's happening in the utility buying sector of the market. That's something that we think is going to heat up over the next two to three years. So against this backdrop, um, there's also a lot of idle supply. So, um, and this has been a function of being in a bear market for many years. The largest producers in the world have shut, shut in production or scaled back production because they just couldn't produce uh, uranium in, in, at, a, at, a, at a price, at the current price in the market, in the market for a number of years uh, at a loss. So this is an interesting dynamic on the supply side, which I'll get into. And then lastly, I talked a little bit about some of these decarbonization goals, but I think one of the most compelling things that's happening right now is government policy around the world is changing and that narrative around nuclear is, is, is really changed. Okay, let's talk about um, nuclear in terms of reliability. This is really important of late. Um, as you can see, compared to other forms of energy generation, Nuclear is one of the most reliable in terms of that base load power. Nuclear operates all the time, 24 seven. There's very few times they turn off a, a plant. It's basically maintenance and refueling. Um, if you compare that to other forms of energy, they're more intermittent. And yes, there will always be lots of support, either financial or from a policy perspective for renewables like wind and solar. What we have learned in the last 12 months is that their inter intermittency can cause real problems. And I'll talk about that a little later in the presentation because Europe is having all kinds of issues right now. Okay, let's talk about efficiency of uranium. Uranium is a very dense element and obviously 
uh, is what creates this nuclear fission inside of a reactor. And just to give you a sense of uh, the comparative energy densities, if you think about a uranium fuel pellet, which is, we use affectionately this little gummy as a, as a, a, a representative sample of how big one of these uh, pellets are, it has the equivalent energy of three barrels of oil, one ton of coal, or 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. So it's an incredibly dense um, material for energy production. If you think about how uranium in the form of U308 or yellow cake is stored, it's typically stored in you know, a steel drum that you would typically uh, see oil stored in. And, if, and if, you fill, if you fill about half of one of those drums with yellow cake, which is a yellowy powder, it would weigh about a thousand pounds. It is a very dense element and is incredibly fuel uh, efficient. Just talking about clean, this obviously is becoming very, very important. Um, people are realizing around the world that greenhouse gas emissions and climate change uh, have a direct link. And if you look at the greenhouse gas emissions from nuclear, they are the lowest. Um, this is very important. If countries are going to meet their greenhouse gas reduction targets, there's no way they could, they could take nuclear offline. If you look at coal, it's the dirtiest. And what I, find, what I think is will, uh, many people will find surprising is that coal still represents one of the largest sources of energy uh, generation in the world. So you have still a legacy fossil fuel like coal that is the dirtiest accounting for a large part of energy production. And what's interesting about that is that the world is becoming increasingly electrified. Elect electricity needs to continue to grow as the emerging markets become more wealthy. So let's talk a little bit about safety. Um, obviously, there have been horrific accidents at Chernobyl and Fukushima in the past, uh, which I think scar a lot of people. But if you actually look at the bigger picture, nuclear is actually one of the safest. Uh, nuclear energy has become much more safer in, since Fukushima and Chernobyl. And if you compare it to some of the fossil fuels, this is everything related to the mining and production. They're actually quite dangerous. Coal, again, being the dirtiest, it's also the most dangerous if you think about coal mining. Um, so nuclear, although it has this horrific track record of a couple of big accidents, if you look at the act, total deaths from producing nuclear, it's, it's the lowest. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the past. Um, and these are the prior bull markets in uranium. Um, and there's been two very dramatic bull markets, one from 1973 to, to 1978, and the second one from 2000 to 2007. They lasted between five and six and a half years. Uranium on both of those uh, bull markets had very substantial gains of 629 and 1800% respectively. Um, if you look at the, at the uh, chart since 2007, uh, obviously the financial crisis in 2008, followed by Fukushima disaster in 2011, really took the wind out of the nuclear story and a number of countries started to rethink their approach to nuclear. Um, when you think about the price of uranium per pound in 2011, right before Fukushima, it was around $70 a pound. It fell all the way down to just under $20, reflecting a very big overhang of supply when all the Japanese reactors went offline, along with growing concerns that countries like Germany were going to phase out their fleet of nuclear reactors. This big secondary supply overhang really weighed down the market for a number of years. The, the major producers of uranium basically responded and they shut their minds, as I mentioned, and curtailed production. And there are a number of uh, ounces or pounds, I should say, in the ground that are, are waiting for higher prices before they will be produced. You can see that in the last um, few years, uranium has based, and since November 2016 is up about 140%. And that's over five years. And I guess our belief is that this, the price will continue to grind higher to a new incentive price that will bring uh, the idle capacity back online to meet future needs of, of the reactors. So I'll talk a little bit about uranium buying in the spot market. Um, historically, the uranium market is driven by the term market and that's where utilities buy uranium on, on multi-year contracts, supply agreements. Um, you don't run a power plant with a just-in-time inventory policy. You typically buy uranium for three, four, five, all the way out to 10-year 
supply arrangements so that you've always got material on hand multiple years in advance of when you actually need the, the uranium. You can see that in the middle part of, uh, of the chart there, there was a very long period of very little activity uh, after Fukushima. The market really dried up as the price collapsed. And then in the last few years, you can see it started to perk up back to life. And particularly in 2021, in the last 12 months, we've seen a lot of activity in the spot market where you've seen different investment funds uh, buying physical uranium, a number of the junior uh, uranium equities buying uranium and, and along comes the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, which as David said at the beginning, has had a, had a very big impact on the spot uranium market. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Okay, so let's just talk a little about about uranium equities. Um, so uranium equities, um, we you know we don't have a fund related to uranium equities, but I think it's interesting to look uh, at how the uranium equities have behaved in relation to the price of the of spot uranium going up. And we look at this because we think it's an interesting signal from a very large group of investors that are forecasting or have a forward looking view of what the future price of uranium will be. And clearly this signals to us that equity investors in the uranium market are very bullish about the longer term price of uranium. Okay, let's talk about uranium demand and supply. And, and this really comes down to end users and those would be the nuclear power plants. As I mentioned, they need to buy material always out on the curve. And because we've had all of this shut in capacity the last few years, um, there is this structural supply deficit that has emerged. And what that basically means is the current fleet of reactors need about 170 to 180 million pounds of uranium every year just to, to, just to operate. So every year they have to continually replenish the, the supply of fuel rods for the reactors. And if you look at the supply chart, it's been falling as these um, mines have basically been shut in which has created a, a, a deficit. That deficit has been fed by some secondary supply. And the big question that we're, that a lot of investors are, are interested in is when will the utilities start to buy uh, through new, a new contracting cycle and really start to help support the uranium price? Um, a month or two ago, the uranium price was, was, was in the 30 to $35 handle. Now we're in kind of 45 to $47 range and that has obviously got the attention of a lot of utilities who for many years would look at the uranium market and say there's plenty of uranium there's plenty of uranium at 30 odd dollars or 35 dollars I don't really have a lot of urgency to lock in price or lock in supply I think that narrative is clearly changing a lot of utilities are watching the marketplace right now and trying to figure out how the market dynamics have changed and how they need to rethink their approach to securing uranium for the long for the long term. Okay, I mentioned uh, this point. Um, the world wants more electricity. You know, in the Western world, we obviously uh, can turn on uh, our, our lights and, and have electricity on whenever we want. The reality is in lots of parts of the world, they live with uh, much lower levels of, of electricity usage and brown things like brownouts are, you know, which would, I don't know how we would function and without power uh, during certain parts of the day, but it's not uncommon in parts of, of the world where the electricity just turns off for certain hours of the day. So there, there is a growing need to generate a power. And the question is, how do you do it if people are trying to move away from fossil fuels? Okay, so here is how the world generates its power. And this is from the International Atomic Energy Agency. And I think most people would be surprised to learn that 38% of all the electricity in the world is still generated by coal. And you know, when I think about coal, I think about something that the world used a hundred odd years ago to, to heat, create heat and electricity. Um, and the world's obviously moved uh, a long way from, from then. So coal, coal is still a huge part of the energy mix. And I think the pressure is building to shut down coal plants. And one of the interesting things is, could coal plants be converted into small modular reactors um, to basically you know, transition from a fossil fuel to a clean fuel and save a lot of the jobs in these local markets? And that's starting to, 
be talked about more and more, which I think is very interesting. You can see there from the, from the chart that nuclear is, is only about 10%. It varies uh, greatly from market to market. Um, and, and new renewables have been growing each and every year as more and more investment is going into them. Okay, so this is what the world looks like in terms of decarbonization goals uh, to 2050 and 2060. And then also what's their share of electricity generation from nuclear? You can see that Canada is about 15%. The US is 20%. France is really the leader in the world at 71% of all of their powers generated by nuclear. Uh, Germany is 12%, soon to be going to zero. Uh, place like China is 5%, expected to grow to 10% with a very aggressive uh, build out of their reactors. Okay, let, I'm gonna talk a little bit about policy shifts. I think this is really interesting. Um, let's start with the United States. So in the United States, nuclear has been always a very pro-Republican position and not so, not so supportive from a democratic side. What's interesting to us is that the Biden administration has already uh, uh, drafted legislation in its infrastructure bill that would be supportive for nuclear. I think this is really interesting. Um, if you also look at the recent announcement in the state of Illinois, where the state um, announced support, financial support for two Exelon uh, power plants that were at risk of closing, uh, I think that's another really good example of how government is stepping in here and lending support, not just to renewables, but also to nuclear. China, as I said, uh, is still a very small part uh, of its energy mix is from nuclear, but it really wants to ramp up uh, its share from nuclear over the next 10 to 15 years because it is still reliant 57% of all of its energy production on coal. And many of us know that there are lots of pollution issues in China, and this is something they're trying to address. Japan, obviously after Fukushima, most of their, their fleet of reactors were, were turned off. There are, there are eight running right now, and I'll talk a little bit about what the new government in, in Japan is, is trying to do there. Okay, here are some headlines. And these headlines are actually from different articles I've come across in just the last few weeks, just to put these front and center of how topical this, this whole area is right now. Uh, starting at the top, the Financial Times, the UK government this week announced that they want to build a new power plant in the, in the UK, which is amazing because most of the power plants in the West have been built uh, and there have been very few new ones. Uh, they've also made a big announcement about supporting small modular reactors uh, instead of these very big power plants, which are very costly to build. Um, so the UK is clearly um, putting uh, its policy forward around supporting nuclear as part of its net zero plan. The new uh, government in Japan has put a, a pro-nuclear position out in the marketplace and said that the only way it's going to hit its greenhouse gas emission targets is to turn is to go back to 30 uh, operating plants. So as I said earlier, they're right now operating at eight and going back to 30 would be a huge step for them. Uh, in France, the leader in terms of nuclear, they just made an announcement in the last week about a huge investment uh, supporting nuclear and small modular reactors. And I talked a little bit about um, the, the next high, uh, headline was related to the Illinois power plants being saved. And then the big, the last one is about what's happening in Europe right now. And this is one of the, the shortcomings of, of renewables. Uh, right now, Europe is going through a, ma a massive energy crisis. And what's happened is their uh, wind turbine, turbines are, are not spinning as fast as the models uh, would, would have hoped they would have uh, achieved because of lower wind speeds. As a result of this, uh, they've had to be, fire up natural gas uh, plants to, to, to make up for that shortfall in le electricity production. And as a result, the price of natural gas is basically quintupled. Um, that natural gas, by the way, happens to come from their neighbor in Russia, which is always a political factor in terms of, of being uh, beholden to uh, that regime. So it's caused a uh, gas price to, to go through the roof because of the in intermittency of renewables. And it's, it is uh, causing some governments there to rethink their policy about how aggressively they can shut down their nuclear power plants 
if there is this this uh, limitation with with some of the renewables from time to time. So bigger picture, longer term, we think there's going to be clear winners and losers in terms of, of, of electricity generation. Uh, no surprise, solar, wind, hydro, biomass, and nuclear, we think will we'll continue to receive lots of support, financial support, regulatory support. Uh, the losers will be the fossil fuels, oil, coal, natural gas. And, and we think this is a long, this is a long game. This isn't about uh, turning off all these plants overnight and, and uh, moving to renewables, but this will be a multi-decade build out and the world will slowly move away from, from fossil fuels. Okay, let's um, stop there and talk a little bit about the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. Um, Sprott manages a number of physical uh, uh, precious metals and commodity funds, the newest addition being the, the Physical Uranium Trust. Uh, these funds uh, all are based on a simple concept, which is they own physical metals, they put them in storage, and allows investors a way to participate uh, in these metal markets uh, through, through a very easy to use exchange traded offering. So all of these vehicles trade on the TSX. Uh, all of the precious metals vehicles are also duly listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Okay, so the mandate of the fund is very simple. It basically invests in physical uranium. Uh, right now it owns primarily U308 or yellow cake and owns a little bit of another form of uranium called UF6. It's a passive vehicle in that it just, it basically acquires uranium and puts it in storage. It doesn't make market timing bets. It's a perpetual trust, which means it doesn't have an end date, doesn't have an end game. As long as investors want to invest in the space and if they want to contribute capital to the fund, the vehicle is there to, to basically acquire the, the capital from investors and purchase more physical uranium. It's a very simple model. We don't sell any uranium into the market. Uh, we don't have a redemption feature on the fund. So it's, it's, it goes into the fund and it basically it sits in, in different uh, conversion facilities in the Western world. We store, them at, we store the uranium at Cameco in Canada, Combardine in the US, and Arano in France. Uh, those are the three uh, major Western um, conversion facilities. We have um, WMC Energy that acts as our technical advisor to Sprott Asset Management. And both of these, uh, both of these individuals are longstanding, um, longstanding uh, participants in nuclear uh, industries. And they basically advise us on procuring your uranium, storing uranium, um, all, all things related to the physical, they've been very helpful for us in terms of building our knowledge base and our expertise and our network of relationships. Okay, so the key benefits of the trust. So it's the world's largest physical uranium fund. And we think that's important because we want uh, the fund to be large enough and liquid enough to incent investors of all size to come in and participate in the fund. And when we acquired the fund, it was about 630 million uh, uh, U.S. dollars in size. We felt it was too small to really get a lot of larger institutions involved in the in the sector. And it's been one of our key goals since we launched the fund on July 19th, 2021, to scale it to size to incent those investors to come in. We have a lot of experience running these commodity funds. We've been running them for over 11 years. We have 250,000 investors across the suite of funds. And WMC, as I mentioned, that bring a great amount of knowledge. These are very liquid and easy to, weigh, easy to own investment vehicles. Um, obviously, no one can go and acquire uranium themselves. It's, a, it's, a, it's probably the most regulated, secure supply chain in the world. So there's no other way to really gain exposure to it other than investing in the equities. So we think this is a really interesting way to get exposure to that spot market. Um, one of the key things we did to modernize the trust was to provide more transparency and disclosure and specifically what we're doing there is we, we disclose every night the uh, net asset value of the fund, the pounds of uranium, the number of units outstanding. And that really gives investors much greater transparency to understand exactly how the trust is trading relative to its underlying net asset value. And this is really important because we believe it will help the net asset value and the market price stay more closely aligned over time. And, and it has a low management fee of 35 basis points plus operating expenses. 
Okay, so this chart is already out of date, believe it or not, from just a few weeks ago. I mentioned it has, um, it has actually now has 34 million pounds uh, of um, U308. So I guess we can power all of the reactors in France for I think 17 months now. So it is a lot of uranium. Um, and as I said, when we acquired uh, Uranium Participation Corp in July, we started off with approximately 18 million pounds. So we've grown the trust um, pretty quickly since, uh, since its inception. Okay, so this slide basically shows how the trust is traded, its net asset value against its closing market value. And the, the simple takeaway here is that they've been very closely tethered together. And that's exactly what, what you wanna see. One of the key benefits of ETFs and, and price transparency and disclosure about the assets that the trust holds is it should keep these two things more tightly uh, tethered over time. How was the trust traded since its inception in July? You can see this is the premium or discount to net asset value. This is a simple test that shows you is the trust trading at a rich or cheap level to the value of all the assets in the fund. And you can see for the most part, it's been trading at, a, at premiums to net asset value. And there's been a few days where it's traded at very small discounts. That's important to understand how it's trading. And I'll tell you a little bit why that's important because of something called an at the market uh, program that we have. An at the market program basically allows us to raise capital in the trust if we can do it on an accretive basis to the prior day NAV. So that NAV disclosure is very important to us. You can see we implemented the at the market program on August 17th. And here we show day by day how many pounds of uranium we've purchased in the trust and what the cumulative buying of that, this shows 14 million pounds, what we, we breached 15 million earlier in the week. So we've had a very profound impact in terms of buying on the spot market. And that's where we will, we will continue to buy uranium in the spot market. This shows you our uh, pound, the pounds the trust has acquired versus the price of uranium. And you can see that the trust has helped uh, with price discovery, which we think is very important in the uranium market. And is one of the key pieces of feedback we received when we acquired UPC that many participants said to us, We'd really like the trust to play a more active role in the spot market, make it more liquid and help with price discovery. And I think the trust thus far has done a good job on that front. Okay, so just to sum up, um, the trust has, uh, has, has really helped the market evolve. The structural enhancements we've made to the predecessor vehicle, I think have been very well received by the marketplace. It's made the fund, I think, much more investable to a larger audience. The daily transparency of the net asset value and the market price, I think, is, is, has been very well received. Uh, is very large. It's a very large fund now, 1.7 billion US dollars, and that is incenting more and more institutions to invest in the fund. We're seeing interest right around the globe right now. Um, I would say that in the early days of, of the trust, we saw interest primarily from early stage contrarian investors in uranium. That interest has clearly broadened out in the last two months. We're getting many more inbounds from, I would call more generalist investors that are interested in uranium for the first time, or we're interested, we're involved in uranium in some way in the last cycle, forgot about it and are, are, are kind of revisiting it now. As I said, we, we think that the trust has a role in price discovery and making the market more liquid and transparent. And the ATM uh, capital raising mechanism uh, is a very efficient, and cost-effective way for investors. And we run this ATM program for all of our trusts. We've been doing it this way for about five and a half years. We've raised about $6 billion through this mechanism and have a lot of experience with it. And when, there's, when there is investor interest, the ATM is basically there to, to provide liquidity. And then finally, I would just close off by saying that although the price of uranium has jumped from about $30 to 47, we still think we're in the early stages of this bull market and that the incentive price will eventually be reached. You know, I don't know exactly what it will be, but I think the market needs to rebalance. The structural supply deficit needs to fix itself, and that will require a higher incentive price for these idle, idle mines to come back online. And with that, I will turn it over to David. 
Great, John. Thank you very much. I think you covered a, a broad set of topics there. So uh, we have an awful lot of questions already. So I've been uh, you know, feverishly trying to organize them in some sort of uh, reasonable manner. But uh, why, don't, why don't we start off here? You know, has, has the um, you know, ESG, you know, it's a key investment theme. And we've, we've seen that it has led to policy shifts by the Democrats in the US to other global uh, governments as well. Do you believe this is a matter of the public reacting first to need the curb to the need to curb climate change and the government's following or, or you know, we, we're seeing, you know, unbridled support for nuclear power these days, like we haven't in the past? Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's really interesting. I think it's a, a simple realization um, that even though it is a polarizing topic and there are still uh, groups that are very anti-nuclear, I think the government has clearly taken the position and acknowledged the issue that we cannot just simply go 100% renewables and have reliable baseload power. Um, so I think that's that's thing one. I think second of all, you know, if I find it interesting that if you still have huge amount of, of energy production still being generated by coal. I mean, why wouldn't you just, why wouldn't you try to force a lot of these coal plants to, to cut back or to shut down? I mean, to me, it seems odd that, that, that nuclear is in the crosshairs when you still have huge amount of, of uh, energy still being produced by coal. And on the ESG front, that's one of the interesting things we've stumbled upon when we've talked to different investors is yes, um, Poli you know, policy uh, related to greenhouse gas, gas reductions, uh, decarbonization, electrification, all of these themes have been really important um, in terms of the investment in uranium. But ESG is one that we've uh, also stumbled upon amongst uh, many institutional investors where they're actually putting uranium and nuclear in this ESG bucket, which we think is really interesting. Now, the in the EU, there is a big push going on amongst members of the EU to ensure that uranium is categorized in the, um, the safe energy taxonomy. And I'm not saying that it's universal across all the EU countries because clearly Germany is moving away from, uranium, uh, from nuclear in a very large way. But uh, countries like France and Poland and, and others are lobbying to say, we believe uranium and, and nuclear should be part of this EU uh, uh, safe energy taxonomy that is coming out in, the, in at some point in the near future. And has the shift of thinking uh, towards favored nuclear power helped attract investors specifically to the trust? Perhaps investors that have never participated in the, uh, the Iranian space or the nuclear sector before? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I think people are looking at uranium as a really interesting commodity idea right now. Um, it, it's a much smaller market, and I think it's easier to understand than, than some of the other uh, more global and large scale commodities. So we seem to be getting interest from investors that historically are not commodity investors, which I find interesting. And they're very intrigued by this thesis that uh, nuclear and uranium are, are fitting into either this ESG or decarbonization topic um, or theme or trend and, and, they're, and they want to learn more about it. So um, it's, it's been very uh, interesting to see pockets of interest right around the globe. Mm -hmm. Now, what is it that actually drew Sprott to physical uranium? Is it fundamentals drivers of nuclear is, or is it really more situational with respect to the the uranium market or lack of transparency transparency within? Sure. Well, we've, we've as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, you know, we have a very successful suite of precious metals trusts. Um, we have investors all around the world that, are, that participate in these trusts. And we started thinking about, you know, we, we've created this very interesting franchise. What other commodities could we put inside of this vehicle? And we started going through the list. And one of the ideas we came up with way back in 27 was uranium. And we looked uh, at you know, the different ways investors could participate in uranium at that time. We thought about launching our own fund. We were in the depths of a bear market. And um, you know, while we're contrarian and, and, and um, uh, like to do things a little different than, than most generalist investors, uh, we just thought it was gonna be a very difficult uh, uh, 
very difficult to bring a new fund to market, which is why we started to pursue Uranium Participation Corp in uh, 2018. So it was, it's, um, th this has been something that's been in the works at Sprott for well over two years. Uh, it took us a long time to get over the finish line. I, you know, it, it was a bit of a labor of love and we were committed to it because we thought that the opportunity was real. We thought the supply demand dynamics were, were attractive for, for all the reasons I've, I've, I've outlined. And I'm glad we did because it's, um, you know, the, the response we've got to the trust has been fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned sort of acting a, a little bit contrarian here, you know, doing things that other people haven't. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's your take on the renewed buying in the market by uranium companies, you know, and I'm talking, you know, less the yellow cakes or sprouts or UPCs mm -hmm. of the world, but more of the traditional producers or developers, you know, does, does the fact that they're putting uranium on their books add risk to the market knowing this material might be coming out to, back out down the road? Yeah, you know, it, it's a it's a really interesting point. When when it first started, I scratched my head a little bit and said, "Well, that's different. What I wonder what is driving that." And you know, in hindsight, it, it's turned out to be a pretty clever move, um, given they were buying at much lower prices. And you know, for these smaller companies that are still trying to develop uh, assets and 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 build mines, it's an interesting way to provide exposure to uranium over that interim period until you're actually in production. So I think it's kind of clever. Um, will those pounds come out in the market? Uh, it's, it's very likely they will at some point. And um, the trust would be very happy to sequester those pounds when they are available. Okay, sounds good. Uh, now, can you maybe just, I guess, talking about the way you acquire uranium. Are you targeting producers? Are you looking for a sustainable source? Are your purchases more opportunistic? Uh, you know, the, I think the volumes that you're going after mean you're, you're, you're buying from pretty much anybody, so. Yeah, we're, we've, um, from day one, our, our strategy is to take a very open approach. Um, we had no idea what kind of um, buying interest and in, in we would see from the marketplace. We wanted to be we wanted to be open to all sources available. So we probably have trading agreements set up with about 20 different counterparties right now. Um, so we've cast a very wide net. We've been procuring material from I think 16 different parties so far. Um, and that would be everything from traditional traders to some producers. Um, some, we've bought some, some pounds from different investment funds that looked at the vehicle and said, hey, I don't really have the same incentive to hold physical myself anymore with this new vehicle that's much more liquid and scalable. We've had some investment funds do trades with us around that. Uh, we've actually bought a little bit of material from one junior, junior um, miner. So it's, it's, it's actually been a very wide range of different, of, of different sources. We're, we're very agnostic. Our, our approach is simple. Uh, we're trying to find the best available offers. Uh, so that's price and delivery window. So we look for the shortest delivery window possible, and obviously the best price on each each day. Okay, and where do you see most of the spot uh, selling supply come from? Is it is it producers? Yeah, sure. Well, the market, you know, there's a number of different offtake agreements um, that are that are in place that will be in place for a number of years going forward. That supply historically supplied the spot market with with material every month, um, and we've been buying a lot of that material. Um, you know, historically, there's been a little bit of buying in the spot market by utilities. The question is whether they're going to pivot uh, back to term um, contracts, and that's something we'll be watching for. And there's also been a lot of other non-utility buyers um, buying material alongside us. So we, we, we see them and, and we, see, we see them kind of picking away and buying material with us. Okay. Now, are you seeing much resistance in sourcing material as prices are rising? You know, I think we're at 47 bucks right now, but this, this 45 to $50 range seems to be where your, your, your nav, your, your ATM starts to slow down. So I guess what, what are your plans to raise more money and, and uh, keep moving the ATM forward when you get to these levels? Sure. Well, the ATM is really a function of, of the interest we're seeing from investors. So uh, we're, you know, the ATM is there, it's on standby, it, it, it can theoretically work every day. And I would say the ATM, it fluctuates, um, it, it always will. But 
the last little sell-off that we that we had a couple of weeks ago, I thought encouraged some investors that were watching the space, let's say in September, and kind of thought they missed it, kind of ran away from them. And I thought um, some investors use that as an entry point. So I can tell you that this week we had our single largest block trade ever done uh, in the trust, and that was a fifty million dollar U.S. Uh, institutional mm-hmm. order. Um, so the ATM is not slowing down. Um, I think these these periods where the price is kind of staying a little stable actually provides a really attractive entry point for for larger tickets. Right. Okay. So, and how do you allocate the trading through the ATM versus incentivizing that trade through the open market? You know, and and it, when you do sell through, or I guess, is the unit price set for transactions? How is the unit price set for transactions versus the ATM? Sure. So the, the way the ATM works is um, we have, a, we have a, a, a basic test that we have to meet, which is we can't issue new units uh, at a price level below the prior day now. And that's a fundamental shareholder protection to prevent dilution. Um, so in a day where we've got some premium to NAV to work with, our underwriters, we can instruct our underwriters to issue shares and we completely control the process. We don't have to issue shares. We can be aggressive issuing shares, or we can we can be very you know light to the touch. So every day is a new day, uh, but it's all a, it's all a, a function of how much interest we're seeing, what kind of institutional order flow uh, is 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 uh, out there. Um, some days we're, we're we're as I said we're very light, and some days there's lots of institutional demand, and the ATM is there to basically uh, meet the needs. If the ATM wasn't operating and somebody wanted to come in with a huge order, well, what would happen is the price would run away from you because you'd have to create an incentive price to get a secondary share in your hands. With the ATM, the underwriters are basically filling those orders and then coming to the trust at the end of the day and saying, I just sold these shares, please issue to uh, me them so I can close off my positions. So it's a very effective uh, capital raising mechanism. Right. Okay. And I think one of the one of the reasons why the the trust was actually set up is to actually create transparency of uranium in the uranium price for all. But you know, we have seen some wicked price volatility here in the spot market over the last couple of months. Now, obviously can't blame it all on you. There's a lot of speculation by many players, but is there anything that Sprott might do to help minimize this as the trust makes acquisitions? Or or really do you even want to minimize the volatility? Well, we're not aiming to create volatility, that's for sure. What we're trying to do is responsibly buy uranium to back the, the units that we're issuing. So that's important to remain as fully invested as possible. But having said that, we we are watching our, our purchases a little bit more closely, I would say, given some of the nuances with the market. Um, so we are a little bit more mindful of that, I would say. Um, we are holding a little bit more cash to take care, to take advantage of any uh, dislocations that we're seeing in the market. And so, you know, we're learning as we go. I think the reality is the whole market is learning as we go, because I think the trust has really changed the game board for everybody. And um, I think, you know, whether you're a trader or you're a producer, you're trying to figure out how, how this new landscape works. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not about us. It's about what investors are doing collectively because the vehicle is just a way for them to express their, their view. Okay, so speaking of new new landscape, you know, as, as uranium is becoming a critical component of net zero emission plans in many countries, do you see greater regulatory impact to the uranium market in, in the future? You know, and if so, how are you preparing for this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. We get asked a lot. Um, and one of the um, questions I had of our technical advisor was, Back in 2007, when the price of uranium really went parabolic, what happened? Was there some kind of regulatory blowback? Um, And the the response I got was, no, there wasn't. There isn't any set body in the world that regulates uranium um, in terms of its price. Um, No government intervened in that case. And then more interestingly, I think, no power plant turned off. Everybody had material. for a number of years because they, they buy um, with long lead time. So we don't know of any regulatory body that could come out of the woodwork and somehow uh, intervene here. Um, you know, there's speculators in every commodity in the world. 
Um, there's financial intermediaries um, as well. And we think all of those market participants make the market work better and more efficient and more liquid. Okay, great. Well, 45 minutes goes very quickly. We are up on time, but I guess very quickly, when does the trust plan to list on the New York Stock Exchange? Sure. So we've started the work. Um, we're starting to engage with the New York Stock Exchange uh, in preparation of doing the filing. Uh, we, we hope to put our initial filing in sometime this year, and it'll be sometime next year before we get some clarity from the SEC on, on, on that approval process. So it's impossible to create a timeline um, given it will be a novel listing. It'll be the first time the NYSE and the uh, SEC are going to be reviewing a physical uranium trust. So we're very committed to this. Um, Sprott is putting the bill for this. It was one of the, the elements of our, of our acquisition. Um, and uh, we, hope, we hope to be listed next year. Okay. Well, thank you very much, John. We appreciate you joining us uh, once again, um, you know, and, and we appreciate what you're doing out there in the sector, uh, you know, carrying the flag for the nuclear industry and the uranium industry. And, uh, you know, it's certainly this price volatility and the price rise has certainly waked a lot of us up that have been in this industry for 15, 20 years. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us. Up next, we have Libero Copper and Gold.